This is Twit. Cricket D N S. It's actually been the topic of a couple of episodes of This Week in Enterprise Tech. First of all, just explain to me how DNS developed into its current iteration. Well, um, you know, DNS didn't sort of jump fully formed from from Paul Makapetris' head. Uh, Paul used some some precursor technologies to sort of inform his work on DNS, something called the IEN 116 name server, uh, something called Grapevine, which was a project that came out of Xerox. Um, and that basically... Uh, you know, led to the use of a hierarchical namespace within DNS uh, and so on. But, I mean, DNS is actually right now not that different from, you know, the way that it looked, gosh, 30 years ago. Uh, you know, we've added new record types. Uh, we've added uh, some tweaks here and there to carry zone transfers more efficiently, to propagate them more quickly, uh, to dynamically update um, zone data, that sort of thing. But, you know, I think that, that DNS today is pretty easily recognizable to somebody who was doing DNS 30 years ago. Right. And now we know how DNS works. Essentially, it allows us to resolve a name like Cisco.com or Infoblox.com into the IP address, be it IPv4 or IPv6, at which that server actually exists at. And then I can route my traffic to that server and get it back, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's the underlying technology of the Internet. However... One of the things that we've seen more and more and we've heard about more and more in the past, so oh, I'd say 10 years, is the vulnerability of DNS. Everyone always says, well, we're using a system that really wasn't designed for something as massive of the Internet. I, I, I want to ask you, I'm not asking you to make excuses, <laughs> but why do you think DNS has so many vulnerabilities? Well, uh, you know, there are different types of vulnerabilities. Um, there have historically been vulnerabilities in implementations of name servers, for example. Um, the Bind name server, which is uh, arguably the most popular name server implementation, has had uh, lots of vulnerabilities over the years because it's been around for a long time and because we find those vulnerabilities uh, a little bit more easily than, than uh, no offense to Lou, we would in the Microsoft DNS server because it's open source. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty heavily scrutinized by, by uh, the Internet community. Um, and we fix those vulnerabilities when we find them. Unfortunately, fairly recently, uh, a guy you may have heard of, a guy you may have talked about named Dan Kaminsky found what are actually systemic vul vulnerabilities within DNS. So uh, design flaws, if you will, that make things like cache poisoning possible. Right, yeah. And, and so, yeah, we know that cache poisoning is basically a... a how do we call it? A uh, aggressive agent, a distrusted agent, someone out there essentially screaming over and over, I am the server, I am the server, I am the server, and trying to get the traffic for another server delivered to him. Right, yeah. right. So what, what allows for that? I mean, what, what I'm trying to get at is when DNS, as you said, was being iterated, as it was being slowly developed, not coming out fully formed, did anyone ever think that th these vectors of attacks would be used to compromise uh, the integrity of traffic on the internet? Well, I think that um, that wasn't a chief worry of, of Paul's when he was developing it. Uh, you know, uh, he, his design is actually an enormous success if you think about, for example, its scalability. But the internet, or even really the ARPANET uh, back in those days, was a much friendlier, more collegial place. And so that, that just wasn't a leading concern when he was coming up with the design.